Um, and while the first thing I studied at university was marketing, uh, and then went on to law school. So I worked uh, doing mergers and acquisitions as a lawyer, uh, especially in corporate governance. But I sort of quite quickly realized the strategy was, was really where my talents lie. Um, and so strategy has always been the thing that I've sort of been drawn to, which has led me to do a bunch of things. For example, now in my normal day job, I am the CEO of an international city consultancy. Um, I tend to work primarily on um, global strategy, either business strategy, market, marketing strategy for big globals. Um, and I suppose what one might call strategic management to use the traditional term. So we're close to, close to traditional management, but still with a marketing twist typically. Um, and then I write a fair bit. Again, the manifesto IPA is effectiveness works in the drums. Now, now um, IPS F works or effectiveness works you may or may not have heard of is from Gentlemen, Les Pinet and Peter Field. They are the poster boys for that anyway. And you talk about, you know, your, your short versus long-term effects in advertising, that kind of thing. And my work there has had to do with how to apply that to a global um, marketing context. And then, yeah, uh, you know, been a, a columnist for marketing week for about two years now with people like Mark Richson and Helen Edwards and Colin Lewis. And yes, and then I traveled around the world and I do talks. Now, my original plan for, for this talk really um, was to do something similar that I do uh, sort of professionally and just have like, you know, the PowerPoint and the entire, that entire shtick. Um, but I was talking to a friend of mine called Samuel Brealy, who I know you've had in, and he was telling me how he had more of a, like almost like a conversational piece and he really enjoyed that. And I thought, well, that sounds cool. So instead of just regurgitating theory, um, you know, I'll be just another middle-aged white guy doing that. I think you've had enough of those, right? But instead, I'm just going to talk about some of the things that I've learned in my, you know, if it's not too pretentious, pretentious of word, my sort of journey on um, going from having decent enough theoretical understanding of strategy um, to being, you know, and doing what I do today, basically. So I thought I'd be doing that for about half an hour-ish, um, and then after that, we can have a Q&A. Uh, as Thomas mentioned, you can send in questions. Uh, if you don't want you know, to send questions that way, you can contact me via Twitter, um, at JP Castlin. Um, and so, yeah, so today, again, I, I thought I would talk about this thing called, what I call strategy in praxis. And I hope this sound is sort of carrying through because I, I do mean praxis, not practice because um, it's something altogether different. Now, to explain what it is, we unfortunately have to go back to Greek philosophy and this happy camper named Aristotle, who you may or may not be familiar with. You may know him from his greatest hits, such as the invention of metaphysics and logic. Um, but basically, his school of thought broke down the scheme of man into three sort of basic concepts or activities, right? And you had theoria, which is thinking with the goal of truth. So that'd be theory in, in, I suppose, modern English. Then you had this thing called poiesis. Now this was doing with the goal of production. So typically this would be, would be translated into practice. Now, usually you have these two, like they create this dichotomy. Either you think about things or you do things. But then he had this third thing called praxis. And this is something that I learned in law school. And that is the thoughtful doing with the goal of action. And it's the combination of theory and practice in a sort of continuous you know, learning cycle, right? Now, usually people aren't aware of that. So because we are human beings, we love to put people neatly into folders. So, you know, you're either a theorist or a practitioner, much like you are a Biden supporter or a Trump supporter. And you can make up your conclusions about what you think of those groups, however you like. But nonetheless, we do that. But this is a problem when it comes to any kind of education or any kind of sort of profession, because one of the problems with, especially when it comes to strategy and, and so traditional strategic doctrine is that a lot of it is based on realities that no longer exist. But similarly, people who only do practice, and there are plenty of people who do that in marketing at the moment, um, 
they just can't be bothered to learn from those who came before them. Now, this means that they are, in metaphorical terms, either reinventing the wheel or they believe that the earth is flat, right? That is what happens. And these are the kinds of people who will say things like, virtual reality is the future of marketing, right? Stuff like that. But of course, if they'd studied history, then they would know that we actually had virtual reality in the 1930s. We did, it was used to um, train pilots for the second world war, but then it disappeared, came back again in the sixties. Then it disappeared, it came back again in the nineties, um, but then it disappeared and sort of, it came back quite recently and now in 2020, it's already on its way out again. So virtual reality isn't changing marketing forever. It's not the future of marketing. It comes and goes every 30 years. It's basically tuberculosis, right? But the thing is that, my point is that neither theory without practice nor practice without theory is necessarily quite good. If you think about theory, uh, theory not practice, it's kind of like if you're at a football game, you're sitting in the stands, you might, you know, you're observing the players, obviously, you might see more of the game, but because you're not participating, you can't really influence the outcome. Now, if you do practice without theory, you're basically doing nonstop perpetual experimentation. You're just trying shit out in blunt terms. And the problem with that is you're not learning and you, you're not understanding why something turned out the way that it did or it didn't. And this in turn leads to money being wasted, companies not taking marketing seriously, which is a significant problem at the moment, and ultimately knowledge to regress, right? So that doesn't work either. So that takes me sort of back to my sort of journey where it all began, right? So I had done m and and I, uh, this is back in during the financial crisis, 08, roughly speaking. And I realized that doing that kind of stuff, the corporate lawyer gig wasn't really for me. And I really enjoyed strategy. But the problem was that I had no prior experience of strategic work, really. I'd done corporate governance, but no real experience of it. I had a theoretical understanding of it, but not a practical knowledge. Now, this basically is, is similar to the situation you will find yourselves in. Now, I've spoken to Thomas and, and it's really good that you've been doing like practical work, but it's close to this situation, right? Because the fact is that when you're studying, what you're studying will not factor in all the stuff that will happen in practice. So most of your days early on, at least it was for me, was basically saying aloud to myself, shit, I hadn't thought about that. Because for example, in theory, when you do your strategy, you're not factoring in, for example, a let's say sales director saying, no, I'm not gonna do that because that'll cut into my bonus. Okay, so then what are you gonna do, right? Or, and this is a practical example, this happened to a friend of mine uh, last year, was that a pandemic hits, right? So the Chinese government forced their company to shut down key factories in China. This, mean, uh, this meant that they had no supply to meet the demand that the marketing department was creating, right? And of course, if you create a demand, that demand doesn't just go away unless you're in a monopoly, it goes to your competitors. So not only was the marketing department creating a demand for which the company had no supply, but they were effectively creating a demand for their competitors. And they hadn't thought about that either, right? And another thing that can happen, and this is demonstrably, literally what happened to me, is that you run into a pure practitioner. And this is a bit of a smack in the face if you are, really speaking, almost a pure theorist. Because what happened was that, and this is, you know, I've been trained in traditional marketing strategic doctrine. I was sitting with a CEO of a mid-sized company and I was doing the usual marketing strategic shtick, right? So you do your diagnostics, then you go into your strategy formulation phase, you do your you know, segmentation, targeting, positioning, and then you get into tactics. And the guy says, well, you know, what you mean by, when you say tactics, that's what mean, we mean by strategy. And I said, well, that's not strategy. And he said, well, to us it is. And 
my initial impression or my, sort of my first instinct was to go, well, I've studied Porter, I've studied Kotler, I know what strategy is. But then I realized this is a guy working for a mid-sized company that was really, really successful. And not only that, but they won a bunch of awards and whatever else. But he didn't have any understanding of strategy, he was an engineer, but clearly he was working anyway. So was I really sure that I understood what strategy was? Did I really know or did I just think I knew? And you can ask yourself, if I were to ask you, what is strategy? Do you actually know or do you just think you know? Now, I know from experience that if I literally were to ask you, you would probably say one of four things. Because usually there are four ways of looking at strategy from, you know, broadly speaking in theory. So typically a strategy is considered A, a plan, a sort of a, a, a how, a, a way of getting from here to there. Right? This, was, is, this is what most people will say. Or it can be a pattern in actions taken over time. This would be what you would find someone like Mintzberg. Or it might be a, a position that reflects a decision to offer certain products or certain services in certain markets. This is where you would find someone like Porter, typically, right? Or it might be a perspective or a vision or a direction. Now, notably, as those of you who are not you know, zoning out already will realize is that these four definitions, they're not just different, they are quite literally different to the point of being each other's counterparts. So a plan is the outcome of direct control and deliberateness, whereas a pattern in actions over time is the outcome of indirect control and emergence. A position is where one is, Whereas a direction is where one wants to be and therefore per definition cannot be. So which one is it? Now, I was under the impression that if, and I think this is holds true for most people working in marketing, that if someone were to hold a gun to my head, I would say that strategy is some sort of a plan, right? What AJ Lafley would say, defining where to play and how to win. And it would be really nice if it was. If that were true, that would be really, really nice. But it makes a bunch of presumptions for itself that I didn't realize because I didn't have the practical experience and I didn't have broad, broad enough knowledge. I didn't get experience or had utilized praxis. And the presumption that it makes is effectively that you can pause reality and you do your strategic planning a bit while sort of the world sits idly by and you do your plan and you press play again and everything will happen just the way that you thought they would do. Just, you know, everything will unfold just the way that you had foretold. That never happens, ever. I've never even heard of that happening. Um, and that's because the analogy that we are told, and maybe you've heard this one, I've heard it probably 50 times in one way or another, one version or another, is this analogy of surfing, right? So we're on the beach we're looking at the ocean. We can spot the waves coming in and all we have to do is pick the right one, get on it and surf and we'll be set for life. Just, you know, go right off into the sunset. Now, some people might be aware that maybe there will be other surfers there too. Some might even acknowledge the fact that you'll probably get wet. But broadly speaking, that's, you know, the idea of strategy. I quickly realized starting out that that's, Absolutely not, that has nothing to do with strategy at all, or rather that's not what strategy is in practice. Strategy in practice, to use the same surfing analogy, is being in the middle of the ocean at night, it's stormy, waves are crashing down upon you from every which angle, you have no idea which one to catch. You have no idea whether you're gonna get eaten by a shark or smacked in the face by another surfboard, or if you actually manage to get on top of a wave whether that wave is going to smash your face in into a coral reef or take you away to the promised land. And because I was working as an independent consultant at the time, I hadn't, didn't have anyone to sort of lean upon. I had, didn't have many people I could sort of, you know, I can sort of get their experience from, so to speak, or talk to and reflect upon these things. So basically to use the same analogy, I was just swimming for my life, just struggling to keep my head above water. And when you do that, 
imposter syndrome becomes really, really strong. Because what do you do when you've been told that if you only do A, it should lead to B and it doesn't? Well, you think you're a failure. I think you, I mean, you think you haven't done it properly, right? And the reason why you think that is partly to do with the discourse, like the, the doctrine that you study at university, of course, but mainly it goes a lot deeper than that. It can actually be traced all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. And that's because during the Industrial Revolution, we're talking you know, UK, Britain, England, late 19th century, you had all these factories and the economy was booming and they needed engineers. So basically what they did was they went to the schools and said, okay, so we need people who are good at maths and chemistry and physics and all these you know, core subjects that basically presume that if you do A, it will lead to B. And if it doesn't, you're doing it wrong. Because those were the kinds of people that were needed. Engineers, again, because they could build the factories, design the tools, whatever. The problem is that these subjects are still core subjects today. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these subjects. I'm absolutely not. And especially mathematics and statistics, if you work in marketing, is really, really helpful. My point is that they will basically train you to think that if I do A, it will lead to B, right? That we work within an ordered system. Now, crucially, we work as marketers, we work for companies. Companies are complex and companies act within complex spaces that are competitive, i.e. markets. And I wish I had known that when I started out, I didn't. It was a, quite a late discovery. Complexity theory is something I discovered quite late. But the key thing you need to know about complex systems is this. In complex systems, linear causality does not exist. Now I'm gonna repeat that because it's, it's a really good, difficult thing to grasp, but in complex systems, linear causality does not exist. Now, I was under the belief that complexity just meant that things were really, really difficult. And I just had to dig a bit deeper. But the problem is that because there is no linear causality, you cannot dig deeper. You can never get to a root cause. You can get to a root plausible cause, but you can never find the cause. And this was really frustrating to me, but because I was aware of this concept of praxis, I realized that I needed to study more and keep learning. And so I dug deeper, not in the actual problem, but in theory. And I updated my theoretical knowledge and I got a bigger, I suppose, what a management consultant would call a knowledge base. And then I took that into practice. And then I tried new things out and I tried to involve my learning from that and you go on. And don't get me wrong, what you guys need, or what, sorry, what you guys are studying, you absolutely 100% need. It provides the foundation for everything else. And I have very little patience for the kind of goodwill hunting argument where someone will say, well, you know, you wasted X K dollars on an education you could have gotten for $1.50 at the public library and late charges. Because that presupposes that you know what to read. And you don't. If you have no one like Thomas telling you what to read and you have no prior understanding or contextual understanding, you basically have no idea whether you're going to end up in the marketing section of library or in the Harry Potter section of library, right? But my point is that you need to read broadly and you need to read critically and you need to continuously update your knowledge. And this does not end when you leave college or university. I'm sorry to say it just, it does not. It's a continuous learning process, perhaps it says. And you need to question not only what people are telling you, but what you're telling yourself. Why, again, do I know these things or do I just think I know these things? Now, again, my problem was that I hadn't heard of complexity theory. So I just thought that you could dig deeper. Again, again you cannot do that in complexity. It doesn't work like that. And the reason why is because the behavior of a complex system is different from the behavior of people within that complex system or agents within that complex system. The whole is larger than the sum of its parts. And the way that I can explain this in perhaps simpler terms 
is to think of an ant, right? So if you observe an ant, you'll see that it's hunting for food or you know, walking about doing whatever it is. And we can't extrapolate that behavior onto the behavior of a colony because the behavior of a colony is different. It's emergent. It can do things like wage war against other colonies or uh, raise effort livestock or um, build nests, things that would be far too complex for an individual, individual ant to do. It just, just doesn't have the competence uh, or the instinct to do that. So we can't expand the behavior of an ant into the colony and can't reduce the behavior of the colony down to the ant. But what we can do is that we can observe the pattern in the colony's behavior. And this is where I ultimately finally take it back to marketing, right? Because I haven't, I haven't done that far off these. Human beings are not ants. You know, obviously we're not, right? We're much more complex than that. But the same principle applies. The behavior of an individual buyer will tell you nothing about your customer base. So you can't extrapolate the, the, the behavior of an individual buyer onto your customer base. But you cannot reduce your customer base to a single individual either. And I'm sorry if you're into buyer personas, that's kind of why they don't work, okay? But what you can do is you can observe the emergent behavior of your customer base and you can draw conclusions about the patterns. And this is where I know that, that if, if you're in the US, you maybe you haven't read Byron Sharp and the Ehrenberg Baths Institute as much as perhaps one would recommend. Um, but what they've done over in Australia, on the backwaters of Australia, is they've looked at patterns and markets across 60 years, all kinds of verticals. Think of a vertical, think of a category, they've been there, done that. From traditional FMCG all the way to software as a service companies, whatever it might be. They've done it. And the same patterns are everywhere. And one of the patterns, for example, is this thing called negative binomial distribution. Now, I suspect that maybe you'll have a guy called Wiener Snyder in some time in the future, and he knows a lot more about this than I have 11 now. But I could break it down to you like this. At any given point in time, your company will have a few people, a few customers who will buy you a lot. And you're gonna have a lot of people who are gonna buy you a little. And if you plot this out on a graph, it looks kind of like a banana, okay? This will hold up for every category, every brand, all the time, everywhere. I have not I haven't never even heard of an exception to this rule. The pattern is the same. But it, crucially, you won't be able to pinpoint the individual who will be find or found in either this, of these parts of the graph and then predict what they're gonna do next. Because again, human beings are complex and well, shit happens. So it might be that your most loyal customer actually gets cancer or loses their job or moves to another city, things that you cannot control. And this is why uh, this can be explained by another market pattern, which is called the law of buyer moderation. Easily speaking, or in simple terms, buying behavior follows regression toward the mean. So if you look again over a period of time, some of the people who bought you a lot, well, they will buy you less. And some of the people who bought, the people who bought you a little will buy a bit more. And some people will stop buying you all together and some will start. Now, again, this holds up everywhere. And if I'd known this before, then I would have been able to be a lot more successful than I was. Because this is also one of those things that deals with complexity and complexity is an unavoidable factor when you're working with companies and those companies work within marketplace. And this basically means that, to paraphrase a friend of mine, that strategy ultimately, whether you're working with marketing strategy or business strategy or strategic management, whatever it might be, is not an equation to be solved. It doesn't work like that. You don't have all the pieces in front of you. It's a numbers game to be played. You can never ever guarantee an outcome, but you can improve the odds of success. And I know that because basically I've done that. I've been there, done that. I have a t-shirt and the postcard. Um, and to illustrate, to, to take it back sort of full circle a bit, where I started to where I am right now. 
when I started again, I was very much traditional strategic doctrine, STP and so on and so forth, Porter, whatever. Compared to where I am now, I'm completely all, altogether different person. So last year I did a um, global marketing strategy for a big uh, global company. And for those of you who are unaware, global strategy is basically about steering regional behavior. That's the point of it. Now, the traditional view, and absolutely what I would have done at the beginning of my career, is to explicitly define what we are going to do, strategy being sacrificed and all that, and then implicitly define what we're not going to do, right? Direct control and steering. Now, the more modern approach is to do the opposite, to explicitly define what we are not going to do thereby you implicitly define what we are going to do. So in complexity theory, this is called you create, create constraints and boundaries. And within that, then you can apply principles. For example, you know, what we have learned from all these market patterns, the importance of net reach, ensuring that we have a really, really good creative height and everything we do, stuff like that, right? Now, when I started, I did things that just didn't work and I didn't really understand why. Now I do things that really, really work, but I know it's not because of my doing. And what I mean by that is I basically help nudge the organization in a certain direction, but what happens is largely out of my control. I can manage it, I cannot control it. But having said that, if you look at the performance of the countries that implemented this first, they were so drastically outperforming those that were late that the company could not afford keeping those uh, countries lagging. They just had to do it. And the reason why, again, is because it's praxis, is looking at how markets work, understanding the complexity of it. That's the theoretical bit implementing that into a practical reality. We can create constraints of what people can and cannot do and then let them solve whatever problem it is, you know, as it emerges and how they best see fit. And we update and we learn continuously all the time. And the point of that is that it basically shows not only the importance of practice, but how important it is to keep learning to update your knowledge base and keep doing that because that will separate you not only from the theorists, but also the practitioners. And it will put you into a place where not only are you humble, but you're actually a lot better than the competition. And I guarantee you that will happen, or at least it'll improve the odds of it. Because remember, and this is one of the most important things I've learned. Most companies make it not because of their competencies, but despite their incompetencies, okay? You can fix that if you just do it properly and you employ practices. That's it, thank you. Thank you, awesome. Thank you. All right, a few questions came in. One, the first is, how do, yes. com how do companies find you? As um, it, uh, broadly speaking, I have quite a big sort of public persona, I suppose. Um, Marketing Week greatly helps. Um, being on social media, being quoted by a lot of companies. So for example, you'll see my work quoted in you know, reports by big media agencies, creative agencies, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, and I'm not necessarily advocating this as a sort of a scale tool, but word of mouth really helps. If you're good at what you do, people tend to tell one another. Um, if you do into freelance, this is, this is a very brief side note, but it's something that I learned that you don't want to do this, right? Um, because I'm a lawyer as well, um, most of my early clients were under NDA. And you know, most of my clients still are. But the point being that Within the NDA, I basically said, yeah, I won't be able to tell, you know, other people about you, um, you know, keep a lid on this, this, that, and the other. Of course, what that means is that my portfolio was screwed. 
because then other clients would go, well, who have you worked with? And I would have to go, well, <laughs> yeah, I can't really talk about that. You know, whereas now I can. So I can talk about the company that I work with. Uh, and that of course helps too. But it is one of the problems because in complexity, because there is no linear causality in complexity, it basically means that you cannot do the same thing twice. And if you're a consultant, you live on trying to sell what you've already done. That's a really interesting challenge, by the way. I, um, so it's the selling proposition is interesting, but yeah, but anyway, it's, it's the usual state. It's creating awareness, creating salience, and then try to uh, convert on that. I, one uh, question that came through is, have you worked or uh, executed a marketing program that didn't uh, go off as well as you planned? And then how, how did you handle that? As well as, do you enjoy working with big companies or small companies? Um, I'll start from the behind, from the, the rear, so to speak. Uh, I prefer working with big companies because most of the stuff that I do is quite, not to blow my own horn, but it's quite advanced. Um, complex, <clears throat> sorry, complexity theory, for example, and and managing systems, that kind of thing, is it takes a certain level of, of maturity within the company, typically, um, to be attracted by that or understand that. Uh, when I started out, I did mainly SME work, but then I sort of, I've done more and more big uh, brand work and now only work with big brands. Um, in terms of marketing plans that didn't work out, I've done plenty. Um, and why it didn't work out, it was all kinds of reasons. It was, um, one of them was uh, the company in question had a sales division, which basically consisted of five people. It is more than five people within the organization, but it was um, one guy in particular. And he basically was responsible for about half their revenue. And then he quit. Uh, so he had no one to, to convert. Um, another one of my spectacular failures was um, when I was working for a company and they wanted to do a rebrand. Now, as a rule, rebrands are completely pointless uh, because they destroy uh, salience and what are called distinctive brand assets. But, you know, for certain contexts and certain cases, yeah, sure, I can see a point of doing a rebrand. But anyway, this company wanted to rebrand. And within this rebranding project, we needed to, to bring out a new logo. And then someone in the company uh, thought, why don't we do, because they, they this company did uh, graphical design, among, among other things. And one person said, well, why don't we hold a competition? We'll hold a competition within the, the organization and whoever creates the best logo will win. Sounds great, right? <laughs> this idea in the history of corporate uh, history. Um, of course, what it means is that you're gonna, gonna have one person who wins and everyone else is pissed off that their design didn't win. So that's what we started. The problem was that, so on the Friday, one person won, the rest of the company is pissed off. The C-suite then realizes, but well, hang on a sec, we haven't used our own designs. So on Saturday, the C-suite puts forward their design. They're all shit, but because they're the C-suite, one of them is then taken to be the winner. Oh, so not wow. only do you have a crap logo, the rest of the company is not only hating the logo, but they're hating the C-suite for just, just overriding them. Uh, and that just did not end well. Um, but I think that that the key thing when it comes to marketing plans or any sort of rebranding project or anything like that is the thing is, shit will happen that's not going to be your fault. And if you are, like I mentioned, if you're trained to think that, well, if I just do A, B will happen, when B will be largely out of your control, um, then you're going to take that personally. You can't really. What's important is that you learn from whatever happened. Even if it was out of control, what, what happened that was out of your control? Did Trump do anything? Uh, did the product not work? What was it? And then you just you try to learn from that and you grow. And that, I think that's the key. Again, practice, not practice. Uh, just, yeah, you did mention, I, 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 maybe Sam told you, or Samuel told you that uh, we are going to have the author of Eat Your Greens speak to our class. Yeah, Weimer, yeah. That is our textbook this semester. Oh, we, yeah, Weimer is lovely. I, I've uh, known him for quite a while. We do a lot of talks together. Uh, he's the banana guy. He, he's, he's the green banana about, guy. Yeah. yeah, he's going to be talking about patterns and, yes. um, you know, the banana. That thing is, it, especially from the US, um, and I, I don't mean this um, to be too sort of rude, but the US market, if I'm being completely honest, is slightly lagging behind on a couple of these things. 
if you can pick up what he's talking about and a couple of things that I mentioned and, and that Thomas is teaching you, you're going to be realistically speaking, probably five years out of the competition because we can see on the US market that a couple of these things are starting to be implemented through companies like Coca-Cola, for example. But understanding these things will set you so far apart of the competition when you do leave university. I cannot recommend enough listening to his talk. Uh, it's really, really worthwhile stuff. And going back, you know, we're talking about what is, you know, what has led to this and if you do this and leads to that. If I look back at my career ending up where I'm at right now, there have been a couple of things. So first thing is the praxis thing and me being a nerd. The other thing is discovering the uh, Ehrenberg Bass stuff that Weimer will be talking about per, quite early on. So I was ahead of the pack. And the third thing is um, on discovering complexity theory and applying that to, to strategy because I'm, I'm one of few people who do that. So I'm also ahead of the, the pack, so to speak. But I can tell at the moment that the like my big uh, competitors, the big consultancies, the Boston Consulting Group and McKinsey and so on, they are now starting to you realize this thing that you know about complexity that actually that might be worth looking into so you can see it's starting to come as well so we'll, we'll see what happens but um again uh yeah just the weimer talk really really listen to that that's going to be fantastic he's an amazing speaker too and he's going to do one of those proper presentations i bet you well um without it uh, the thing is as far as it's funny next week uh, our module i just uh, finished putting it together I talk a lot about Brian, uh, Byron Sharp and how brands yeah. grow. Uh, we, we've talked about that earlier in the semester. Uh, uh, Ritson and Ritson versus Sharp. I mean, yeah, I agree with you, JP, that America, the United States, our marketing textbooks, our marketing teaching, the things we've been dealing with are all the things that Switzerland and London, England and Australia, that's where I see marketing is what they are well ahead of where we are in the United States in theory and science. Yeah, I mean, I would probably agree. And I, I don't think that this is, it's not to do with the level of competence among the teachers. I think it's to do with a certain level of meritocracy because I've, I've been working a bit with US professors and MBA programs. And I was talking to one of them about Byron Sharp and his work. And the thing that you have to realize, and the thing that Byron needs to realize, is that he comes from a small universe in the backwaters of nowhere in Australia, right? And in the US, if you are to be taken seriously, you need to be published in the Harvard Business Review and certain journals and so on and so forth. He hasn't been that, and he's not interested in that. Um, and that, again, that can be a blessing and a benefit because, of course, it, it does sort of put, you know, certain people that shouldn't be given the time of, of, time of day, sort of, you take them out of the equation. Um, but of course, at the same time, you have the problem with the Harvard Business Review at the moment that is basically turning into Forbes. And there's yeah. a lot of crap in, in, in uh, Harvard Business Review. But if you understand, again, if you understand complexity, then you understand why a lot of the stuff that's in Harvard Business Review is basically just wrong, right? I, and, I, well, there's one yeah. last question. I, I do thank you. I don't want to keep you on the phone or oh, no worries. any longer. What do you, what do you think about companies being prepared for what's going to happen once we get out of the co the COVID thing? You know, the oh, impact of COVID. How are companies going to market their way out of this? Yeah, that is a very, very good question. And actually, that's if you look at um, the view of, and I talked about this quite a bit in the manifesto this year, but if you took, look at the kind of strategic approach that tends to deal the best with, with complexity, i.e. the emergent strategy of something like Minsberg, um, what they fail to realize is that you have to create the capacity to act, okay? And maybe you've heard Steve Jobs say this. He, say that, he said that, well, you know, at Apple, what we do is we wait for the next big thing. Okay, so what am I meant to do with that? Am I meant to keep 45,000 people waiting for you to spot the next big thing? It doesn't work like that. You have to create some sort of, you know, either that's you create an investment fund so you can upscale your marketing, or you prepare for whatever it is. Uh, and that that does require the traditional strategic sort of control approach. And that's you need to balance these two things. Um, but it is a really interesting point. I think that what you need to do is you need to, as much as possible, be able to both stabilize your current cash flow, and, or sorry, you accelerate your current cash flow and stabilize your future uh, cash flow to the degree that you can. 
typically this tends to mean that you uh, work with, again, net reach. You're trying to reach as many people as possible, if possible, basically. And you're just waiting for the tide to turn. But the, what's really important to realize, especially as a marketer, and I've written about this before, is that if you speak to someone like Mark Rickson or you know Peter Field Espinet, they have this analogy about the fact that you need to both water the tree and pick the fruit. What they mean by that is you need to both sort of harvest the demand that exists and create new long-term demand. Short versus long, right? And that works if you know if the economy is doing well and this, that, and the other. But during COVID or recessions in general, brands are basically struggling to survive, which means that not only will they pick the fruit, they will cut down the tree for firewood if they need to. Right. So as a marketer, if you're working with a company, when you see these things about oh, you need to do broad advertising, you can't cut this down or this down, or whatever, you need to be humble to the fact that brands are struggling to survive. So any company that you work with, save for the, you know, the, the biggest ones who are doing well anyway, but they are going to be looking to survive the day. And then once COVID is sort of gone and over, then they'll get to, they'll cross that bridge when they get to it, basically. That's the reality for most companies anyway. All right, well, thank you, JP. I, I know the students in this class, I can see them smiling. Very uh, thankful for your insight, your wisdom. I know I learned a lot of stuff. I gotta believe everybody did. I, again, thank you for doing this for us. Oh, my absolute pleasure. I, I'm gonna mention something. Uh, if you thought that this was a bit incoherent and rambling, um, I do go into detail a lot more in this year's manifesto. Now, I mentioned this to Thomas before, but uh, this year's manifesto is a lot longer. It's kind of like a mini book. And it, it's, it goes quite in depth and is quite sort of cutting edge in a sense. But um, because of this, we're, we have decided to charge money for it just because there's so much work and I've literally worked six months on this. However, if you guys send me your email or send Thomas or have Thomas send me your email or I can send it to Thomas and he can share it with you, uh, I'll send you the PDF for free. Now, if you send me your email, I want to be clear about this. I'm not saving your email. We're not saving your email to, to send you anything or do any kind of you know, advertising marketing, whatever. It's literally putting on an Excel file, send you the thing, delete the Excel file, that's it. So if you want the thing, just contact either me or Thomas. Uh, my email is jp at rouser.se. You can find me on Twitter as well at, at, JP, at jp Castling. And same goes for questions. If you have any questions, just reach out. I'll be happy to answer uh, all of them uh, to my best abilities. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure, and I uh, hope to be brought back sometime in the future. Oh. I'll do, like I'll do a proper presentation on no, no. this. Topic. This is a proper presentation. <laughs> we like these presentations. These informal ones, the students say, are great. So we loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you very and, much. Uh, the students pleasure. there recognize that picture in the back, but it was on TV on Saturday. It looks like the landscape. Yeah, it's uh, the Four Seasons. Uh, that's what it is. Four Seasons Landscape and right there in Philly. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, thank you, JP. And pleasure. Les, say, say thanks as well, everybody. Come on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.